Hey everyone, my name is Craig Steinberg and I'm going to be talking to you tonight about VSP audits and hearings and we're going to talk about how that has changed a little bit in 2019. As you can might as you might be able to imagine, uh, we all have a certain amount of risk of an audit. Some have a higher risk, others have a lower risk. We're going to talk a little bit today about how to minimize your risk and uh, how to deal with audits if they occur. Uh, and hopefully keep you out of trouble. Uh, as some of you know, I'm an optometrist. I'm also an attorney. I've spent a good deal of the last 15 years representing um, optometrists, some ophthalmologists, some opticians after they've been audited by VSP, trying to defend those audits and, and uh, get out of them. Sometimes we're completely successful. Other times we negotiate settlements. Sometimes I've been unsuccessful. But by far the most important factor and all of those audits has been the quality of the records and the material that I have to work with to defend the audit. So, okay, so very briefly, this is an outline of what, we're, what I'm gonna talk about today. We're gonna to start with, first with Medicare audits because I wanna be able to compare them to VSP audits and it's important background information for you to know. Then we'll talk specifically about VSP audits, the types of audits, common issues that I've seen and common things that get you audited. We're going to talk about general principles of defending audits, which is what do you need to do to enable audits to be defended, um, especially record keeping. We're going to touch briefly upon the changes to the VSP auditing in 2019, and we're going to talk about how to defend yourself, the, the VSP audit process, the appeals process, the remedies VSP can go after, uh, and that's how we'll wrap it up. Okay, so let's begin with some information about Medicare audits, which will give you a nice frame of reference for when we talk about uh, VSP audits afterwards. There are three types of Medicare audits that you will encounter. There is the local carrier review audit, the recovery or RAC fee-for-service recovery audit, and finally, we call the ZPIC or Zone Prevent Provider Integrity Compliance Audit. Those are similar to an IRS compliance audit and, and they're not a good thing as we'll see in a moment. So talking first about the local carrier review audits for Medicare. In these audits, what they're looking at is a procedure that you are doing more frequently than others in your area. I've shown an example of a little cut and paste here from one such audit. This doctor was audited because in the time period they looked at, he had done over 200 of these, whereas the normal peer group had done a few. It's hard to say how many, but not more than a couple. And so he was doing a lot more of this, these particular procedure codes. So Medicare via mail, these are always a mail-in audit, requested the charts for um, in his case, 30 records. It'll normally be 10 to 30. They asked, if, asked for the records for 30 people. And what they're looking for is the medical necessity. Well, first they're looking to see if you actually did it. And then assuming you have the evidence in your records that you actually did the procedure, whatever it may be, punctal plugs, OCT, whatever it may be that they're looking at, um, they're looking for whether or not there was medical necessity to justify it. They're gonna look at your chief complaint. They're gonna look at the patient history the findings and whether or not um, they're going to recover the money for that or not. The second kind of Medicare audit you may encounter is called the RAC or Recovery Audit Contractor Audit. These are national in scope. They're also a mail-in. What's different about them is that these are targeted to certain CPT codes of interest to the people in Washington that make these decisions. They identify particular codes each year that um, they think may be abused or being billed incorrectly, and they will audit those across the country. In iCare right now, the two that are listed are the new patient codes, both the ophthalmological and the E&M codes. So they're looking at whether or not doctors are billing uh, for a new patient, someone who is not actually a new patient. Uh, that's the 92004 versus 92014 and the 99213 versus 99203 uh, type issue. 
these are performed by contracted entities, not by CMS themselves. They hire these companies to do these audits and they are contingency based. And that's important because that means they only get paid if they recover money. So they're really gonna look hard. Uh, <clears throat> they're highly motivated to find things wrong with your uh, records. I've got the website here uh, for where you can look and see what codes are identified right now by Medicare, by CMS as targets for these codes of interest. And it's useful to take a look every once in a while. There are a lot of codes there because it covers all of medicine, but it's useful to take a look every once in a while since that shows you where they're looking and you can make sure your records are uh, not suspect on this type of audit. Again, you have no control over this. You'll get a mail-in notice. So here's an example of um, what's on the website for the not a new patient ophthalmological, the 92 codes. And this shows what they're auditing. They're looking at codes 92002 and 92004. And they're telling you what the rule is. And it's affecting all states. They're looking everywhere. And they're examining records to see if you're billing a 92004 for a patient that's been in the office in the last three years. Finally, the Zone Provider Integrity Contractor, ZPIC audits. These only occur for doctors that are suspected of fraud. Uh, they're still a mail-in audit, but they're pretty extensive. They are specific to a provider, not to a code, although they may be identifying a certain code that they want to look at. There are multiple levels of, of audit and appeal and re-evaluation. Uh, they can be costly to defend. You should have a lawyer helping you with these audits uh, because they're, they can lead to criminal penalties. They can certainly lead to civil penalties. They can lead to being kicked off Medicare. Um, they can lead to something called prepayment review, which is to say that from this point on, they will not pay you until they audit you beforehand. So you bill, then you have to send records in, and then they'll pay you if your records pass. They do use sampling and extrapolation to recover money from you. So even though they may only audit 100 records, which is a lot, but um, you may have a lot more records than that, they will go back a couple of years and they will extrapolate it out based on their statistical analysis of the portion that they audited. So these are serious audits and it, they only come about when they already suspect that you may have committed fraud or may be committing fraud. That's the three kinds of Medicare audits. Okay, so now it's time to move into uh, the meat and potatoes of this talk. We're gonna, we finished with the background material. Let's talk now about VSP audits specifically. Okay, so unlike Medicare and there are three types of audits, VSP, only has really two primary types of audits. One is their quality control audit, and the other is their targeted or their fraud audit, um, which is similar to the ZPIC audit for Medicare. The quality control audits are routine mail-in audits. Um, most of us get those approximately every three years. Uh, typically, they are 10 records. They are handled by the quality control people over at VSP. And what VSP is looking for basically is whether you are calculating things correctly, you're doing your co-pays correctly and your overages, um, determining if you've overcharged or undercharged patients. And they're, they're not uh, particularly complex audits. If they find mistakes, they will ask you to refund money to a patient. They may, if they find a lot of problems, they may do another quality control audit. Sometimes they either impose, uh, they also impose a fee for doing a subsequent quality control audit. But these are routine, they're mandated audits, and uh, we should all expect them. They are not <clears throat> evidence that you are doing anything wrong. Uh, however, I have received over the years many phone calls from people receiving the request for the 10 mail-in records, and they have either been or discovered in preparing the records for the audit that there are problems with their quality control audit. The recommendation is generally the same. Uh, you got to send the records in, don't alter them. 
But there is one situation, I've had several situations, uh, where doctors were audited for a period of time when their primary doctor or, or the owner doctor was out of town and a fill-in doctor was there. And you can call VSP. Um, they're not trying to audit a doctor that was only there for three days or that was covering for someone that was sick uh, or that was covering for you when you went on vacation. So you can call VSP up and say, hey, look, you've asked for an audit. I was on vacation that week, so all my patients were seen by a fill-in doctor that just works for me very infrequently. And they'll usually say, all right, then don't worry about it. They'll send you another quality control audit to do. That said, the main audit that we're talking about today and the main one to worry about with VSP are the targeted audits. These are not mail-in. They are done in office and in office and unannounced. A VSP auditor from the Special Investigations Unit will show up at your office uh, commonly, they show up on days when the owner doctor is not there. Uh, VSP swears that they don't target that. I don't personally believe them. I know that they do call offices and, and make uh, phone calls ahead of time. And the percentage of audits I've seen that occurred when the doctor was not there is way too high uh, to just be chance. So either none of us are actually working ever or VSP will look if they can. Uh, they'll, they'll look to try and come in at a time when you're not there uh, and they'll ask for the records. They normally ask for between 40 and 45 records. Only 40 of the records will usually be in the audit. Sometimes they ask for a few control records. So there may be 43, 44 records that they will ask for and they will sit there and wait while you pull the records and then they copy them. Uh, so they're not going anywhere. And if you tell them you're really busy and you're too busy to do it today, they don't take that as an answer. You still must produce the records for them. Uh, I've had doctors get a zero basically on an audit because they were busy and they told the auditor to leave and they weren't going to cooperate that day. So they'll work with you. They'll sit around a little bit and they'll try and assist. They'll even help pull the records. They're familiar with computer systems. The auditor will go in and pull records. I don't recommend that. I say just take one of your employees and assign them to assist the auditor. You pull the records, you print out the electronic records and that sort of thing. There's no reason for the VSP auditor to be on your computer. Okay, so first question that often comes up is do you have to submit to the audit? Uh, is, it, is it required? Well, it is in your provider contract with VSP. Uh, assuming you are a VSP provider, that you will submit to the audit. You agreed to cooperate with their audits. And if you don't, you can expect that you will be terminated promptly from VSP, probably within a couple of weeks. Is it a HIPAA violation? No, it's not. HIPAA expressly provides for uh, audits to occur and for cooperation with audits. Now, if you are a non-contractor provider, that's a different uh, set of rules non-contracted providers, they don't have a contract. They've not agreed to be audited. Non-contracted providers have every right to tell VSP's auditor to leave and not cooperate. You are not required to participate in, a, in an audit if you are not contracted with VSP. It leaves VSP with really their only remedy if they still want to uh, audit you, so to speak, is they have to file a lawsuit and, and then they can obtain records through the discovery process in a lawsuit. So keep that in mind. You're sort of ratcheting up the, the uh, antagonism, if you will, by refusing to be audited. But if you are non-contracted, you can tell VSP to take a hike. They will tell you you can't. They'll show you a fancy letter that they typed up themselves in their own office, um, making it sound like you have to submit, but you do not. Um, VSP needs a subpoena if they want to come in and, and look at your records or file a lawsuit and obtain records through through discovery. So that's helpful to know for, for some people. If, if, certainly if you've been doing something wrong and they come in, you may not want to assist them by uh, allowing them to audit you. Okay, so auditor comes in and introduces themselves and you're satisfied that they are a VSP auditor. Uh, what do you give them? Well, obviously you're going to give them what they ask for, but you may want to give them more than what they expressly ask for to make sure things are complete. Uh, I, I've seen many audits where 
the doctor had the records that would have answered the question that the auditor had, but the auditor didn't know to ask for them and the doctor didn't volunteer them. An example would be um, one of the things VSP audits for is uh, evidence of dispensing of glasses or contact lenses. They want uh, a record showing that the date uh, that the materials were actually dispensed. I've seen some offices that actually don't keep that in the record, they keep a separate.